Welcome to this uh, session on um, energy and mobility. Uh, it's a part of the Informed Cities Conference. And my name is Gerhorn. Horn. I'm from the University of Oslo. I'm here with Karen Biskop Lindberg, who is from a research institute also in Norway uh, called Sintef. Together, we are going to uh, go through what we have done in the Green Charge project uh, regarding uh, mobility and um, renewable energy sources. The background is, of course, that we in uh, these days, we are facing a need to decarbonize our societies. We are facing a situation where uh, we have to reduce uh, the use of fossil fuels. And at the same time, we have technologies for producing renewable energy, which is like windmill parks or big solar farms. Uh, but these are taking a lot of area. So space, and we might be able to use that space for better purposes. So the question is, can we find a combination that we are able to electrify our societies? And at the same time, uh, we are not consuming too much area and too much space. And this, is, this talk will be partly about that as well, because it's about reusing the area that we have already built down in cities and by housing and the way to produce renewable energy in those situations is, of course, by solar panels. So that's why we will have a focus on solar panels in this session. And we will talk about how solar panels can be used as you and me, for you and me in a personal setting, for increasing our mobility or at least maintaining our mobility level at, as it is today without um, increasing the emissions of, of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So uh, with this, um, I would like to start with um, the, the fundamental question, Karen. Uh, what is, um, how can we connect sustainable energy and uh, mobility? Yeah, well, Geir, I think uh, visually is best. So uh, let's bring up the green charge infographic. Uh, I'll move a bit out, uh, and we can talk you through it. So, what what do we see here? What is this blue line yeah. meant to be? So, what we see here is that when we're talking about sustainable mobility, it's about electric mobility, and when it comes to electricity, then it has to be connected, or it will automatically be connected to your electricity use within the building, at home, or at work or in the street. So the blue line here shows that the charging of the car will be connected eventually to all the other electricity demands within your home. Okay, but but uh, I mean, you, I see the washing machine here and I see the electrical vehicle. Uh, they are competing about electricity here, right? So uh, can I sort of store energy for, for later use? Can I use it when I need it? Yeah, so uh, what's uh, the challenge with electricity is that it must be consumed the instant it is produced. So, as you say, electricity for mobility have to work alongside the existing demands in your home. So, um, and charging your EV will eventually increase your electricity demand. And actually, on, for an average home, uh, and if you're using a, an average car on an annual basis, you will increase your, le your electricity demand by 50%, which is quite a lot. Hmm. Uh, but we can ease this introduction by having local uh, renewable energy generation. The solar panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So that's what we have focused, as you said, in Green Charge on how we can utilize the local renewable energy, uh, not only for the mobility, but also within the homes. But, but when we look at this solar panel, it requires some installation, right? And how, how, how complicated is that installation? Does yeah. it take a lot of wiring? Does it take a lot of extra equipment to be in place for, for that to work? Yes, you need some boxes and wires. So uh, here, we, uh, the, when you need an inverter, which okay. uh, transforms the electricity from the solar panel to a current that you can actually utilize within your home and for charging. And then uh, 
if you have a smart system, you would also have an optimizer that makes an optimal schedule for when you can use your uh, solar electricity, either charging the battery, which is below there, or you could discharge the battery, or you could charge your car, or you could uh, set on or start your washing machine. So, so, so this is what you mean by, by scheduler here, right? Scheduler is, is an optimal plan. Yeah. Ah, okay. I see, I see. Mm. But, but this single solar panel that we have here, um, is it enough? I mean, can I, do I need a bigger roof in order to have a nice um, Tesla? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a good question. So on an annual basis, uh, an average home in Germany has installed about four to seven kilowatt peaks of a uh, solar panel, and that produces between three to five kilo thousand kilowatt hours per year. Uh, and that with, sounds a lot. It's quite a lot. Uh, and if we compare to a car, uh, an average electric car that drives uh, on average 12,000 kilometers uh, a year, it uses 3,000 kilowatt hours. So compared to what the solar panel can give us, which were between three and 5,000, um, I, I would say that uh, the solar panel really helps and could uh, contribute. But, but uh, I mean, we are both from Norway and uh, in Norway and also in Germany and other places in Europe, there is a lot of clouds. So uh, what do we do with if the solar panel is not able to satisfy this demand, uh, we, we still need a grid, right? Yeah. So uh, that's what, uh, when the idea of a smart neighborhood arrives. So here, now we see we don't not only have solar panels on our own roof, but we also have it in our neighboring uh, offices, office buildings, for instance, or, uh, and other homes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So, and, and the idea is then that I can charge my Tesla if I need it from all these resources at the same time, right? But, and then maybe my neighbors can run their washing machines on my solar panel when I'm at work. Mm. Is that the idea? That's the idea of the smart energy neighborhood. Yeah, that we utilize the resources that we have available in an optimal way. But that means we do not need the real electricity grid anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, as you said before, uh, the sun is not always shining. And we, so th the neighborhood still would be connected to the grid. Uh, uh, but it will uh, ease the introduction of electrical vehicles uh, if we also have on site generation and the optimal scheduling so that we can utilize it in the best possible way. Now we talked about scheduling again. Yeah. <laughs> well, can, you, can you be a little bit more precise what you mean about uh, what is this optimal schedule that we are looking at here? Yeah, so uh, I could uh, show you through um, the scheduling part now. Yeah. Um, so if we look at the chart here, mm -hmm. uh, in Norway, at least, we have uh, fleet managers that uh, provide smart uh, charging or smart okay. control of smart uh, of charging. And that's what we can see now here uh, in this upper chart. So in the, uh, in the upper chart, we see that uh, three, we, three colors at least are charging at the same time, yeah. more or less. So the chart here shows that on the x-axis, that's yeah. time. And on the okay. y-axis, it's, it's uh, power. And the red line is? And the red line is the connecting capacity of uh, the charging, of, of the grid to the charging stations. Okay. So we see now here uh, the EV number one, car number one is the gray, the green one enters first, and then a second one, the yellow one enters next. And then when the third car arrives, we see that the power capacity is violated. Mm. So and that is basically infeasible. It's infeasible. So what the smart charging does uh, currently is that it reduces the charging capacity of all three cars and we get a chart like this. Okay, it looks good. Yeah. It looks uh, quite good, but, but we need to become even smarter. And that is what we have done in, uh, in Green Charge. Okay. 
So here, the upper graph shows exactly the same as this yeah, lower graph looks here. looks similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. But here we have said that the timing goes all the way to the next morning. Mm -hmm. So if we know more about each of the cars here, so car okay. number one has uh, said to us that, oh, no, I'm not leaving until 6 o'clock next morning. So it actually doesn't need to start its charging until later or in the middle of the night, as we can see here. So the uh, EV number one starts in the middle of the night. However, charge car number two has said, oh, but I have to leave in two hours. So what happens then is that car number two actually gets all the charging power available and is happy because he has got the power that he needs. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the old part here, it didn't. It only got a very small part and, and wasn't able to charge his battery full. Now, the third EV, she needs to go uh, leave again at 10 o'clock because she is going to overnight at her boyfriend's place. So uh, she will then have her car uh, filled up uh, after EV number two has left. So that's the predictive control. That's the smart uh, scheduling that we're talking about in Green Charge. But, but I presume that this is sort of an uh, ideal situation where you charge them in sequence. You could also still do uh, some kind of charging of two vehicles at the same time, right? You can still do that. Yeah, because uh, I see that you have capacity here yeah. up to the red line. Yeah, so this is a very simple example mm. with only three vehicles. So when you have like 100 vehicles or 200 vehicles that we have in, uh, in Green Charge, uh, then of course the scheduling would be much more complicated. But the, but the idea is the same. But, but in order to know when I'm going to use my car, you need some information from me, right? I, I have yeah. to tell you this, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's when we have uh, the Green Charge app here. The Green Charge app, okay. So here we say we have our happy guy here uh, uh, with his uh, app. Uh, and that's the very good idea of, of Green Charge, that you actually, as a user, before you start or you start a charging session, you have to enter uh, uh, information on when you, are, you think you're leaving and how much charging you think uh, that, you, or that you request. So the difference between the state of the, how much you have inside your battery when you enter and how much you would like your... Uh, uh, battery to be when you leave, so the uh, state of charge. Yeah. So that means always full, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, one would like to have that all the time, that's true. Mm. But, but of course I understand that if I'm just going for a quick shopping or just to my office, which is not that far away, then, then I would not need it fully charged, I understand that. Mm. But it could be difficult to predict though. Yeah, yeah, and also after a while, we hope that people, because you get rewarded if you say, I can charge flexible. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you can also be rewarded if you say, okay, I don't need a full 100% fully charged. So that's also about business models. So you might get a reward rather than a higher price, right? Mm. I, I see that this works uh, sort of in the current situation, but one of the problems with cars today is that they are standing still like 90% of the time and more and more people are like renting cars, buying cars. How does this system adapt to that situation? Yeah, in Green Charge, um, we have also investigated uh, uh, booking of charging uh, okay. and also prioritization so that you can yeah, press I want to be prioritized when I enter and plug in. As we said, with the second EV uh, that we saw in the, in the chart before, that uh, this person had to leave within two hours, then you can choose to have prioritization. Okay, so mm. um, just for the audience, um, if you have any questions to what we are talking about uh, during this session, please put it in the chat. And uh, we have uh, our friend uh, Reggie here that will relay the questions that are coming from the audience. There will also soon be a uh, poll, so stay tuned and, and we will have your opinion on, on that poll uh, as we go along. Okay, so this sounds nice and, and good. Uh, but in order to realize this smart neighborhood, as we are uh, seeing here now, Karen, uh, 
what does it take? I mean, this is also a set of political decisions that needs to be made by politicians and mm -hmm. um, public administrators, right? Yeah, it is. It is challenging, and 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 the challenge is that it's we're dealing with electricity, and as I said in the beginning, electricity needs to be consumed the instant it is produced. So, eventually. Uh, be becoming green and uh, sustainable will need uh, to have a lot of digitalization as well. So uh, the authorities that procure the installation of uh, charging boxes, for instance, or charging points or mobility providers, they would need to understand this more and become act as a more intelligent client. So the authorities need to know what they're asking for in a way. And especially going into the details a little bit more than what they have so far, for instance, uh, on uh, that, uh, yeah, realize the bigger picture of the energy and transport uh, when it comes to procuring the contracts. Okay, but, but if we do this on a large scale for the whole society, um, will there be enough uh, energy in the system or electricity in the system for yeah. uh, really satisfying all these electrical cars? I mean, in Norway, we, we have uh, had quite an intensive stimulation of uh, electrical uh, cars acquisitions and, and stimul financial stimuli for that. So we have a lot of electrical cars. and. Currently, the, the electricity grid and the system is keeping up, but how is this uh, elsewhere? Yeah, in Norway, we have a special situation that where because our society is already very electrified because our buildings are also heated by electricity. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, that means that uh, to electrify, and we also have a very uh, large uh, power intensive industry that uh, consumes a lot of electricity as well. So electrifying the whole transport sector in Norway only increases electricity demand by 10%. Mm. Whereas in Europe, this is different. And as I said before, a, your ho home today, if it's heated uh, with gas or with district heating, it will uh, increase your electricity demand by 50%, which mm. is quite a lot. Mm. So, of course, uh, we need to increase electricity demand, electricity generation, so the harvesting of renewable energy, uh, as well as uh, becoming a more electrified society. We have to do both simultaneously. I, I guess this is sort of what is behind me here now, because uh, the grid is not all, the electricity we get from the grid is, is not always black and white right i can it can be windmills that are providing electricity to the grid it could be like nuclear mm -hmm. or it could be gas or carbon right so this also matters doesn't it it matters and uh, we see that the electricity mix this is what we call it so the mix of different uh, generation technologies that is uh, uh, supplying the electricity grid with different uh, uh, with electricity it varies by country mm. uh, and uh, how green your electric vehicle is of course depends on the electricity mix in your own country uh, but we've seen that uh, with the eu's goal uh, uh, like fit for fit for 55 their main their goal in 2050 is to become that the electricity grid or the electricity generation is uh, yeah, more or less 100% renewable. Mm. So, uh, and, and this transition takes time. Uh, so we have to be confident that uh, the electricity will become greener, uh, but to help also the electricity mix become greener, we are reliant on local electricity generation as well. So we need to push electric, electric mobility along with local renewable energy generation as well as uh, increasing the uh, greenness of the electricity grid. I mean, for my personal wallet, it seems ideal to have my personal production of energy that feeds my uh, car so I don't have to buy expensive electricity from the grid or buy petrol, right? So it's, it seems obvious that it's better 
to have a local production yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And as you said already, it's efficient uh, with a normal rooftop to feed my household's needs of electricity plus my electric car yeah. in, in most situations. Mm. Okay, so um, Reggie, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi there, Guy. Hi there, Karen. Um, thanks for the interesting uh, debate and presentation so far. Yeah, so we do have a couple of uh, questions, and I think we have time to address a couple. Um, Karen, we've got this kind of private household here with the cars and the bikes and everything in it, but from what we've talked about in Green Charge and the Informed Cities Forum so far, private ownership is not necessarily the preferred model from a wider mobility context, but this could be adapted. This could be a shared garage, couldn't it, where this system is, is operating? With shared vehicles, it for could, and uh, uh, yes, you're right, Reggie. And uh, in Green Charge, we have also investigated fleet charging in Bremen, for instance, with PMC. So here you can uh, you can book uh, an electric car, and uh, that is shared by others. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So that's one question, mm -hmm. and then we have this battery over here, <laughs> and we have the sun shining. We have the car. Yeah. So on a brilliantly sunny day, everything's full. Does this mean we just turn, turn the solar panels off and waste this energy, or is there something that um, consumers from, can potentially benefit from here in this system? Uh, using the storage, you mean? Well, using the where does the power go once everything is full? Yeah, once everything is full, the power goes back into the grid, but it could also go to your neighbor, right? So if you have an energy community or smart energy neighborhood, also called, uh, you could send your electricity to your neighbor and they could utilize it okay. for their car. So in this uh, ability to share it to the grid, this is also nationally variable, isn't it? How easy that is to give your energy back into the system. Well, actually it's, it's technically speaking, it's the electricity flows in the direction where the, uh, the resistance is at its lowest. So the electric, uh, the electricity and electrons don't see these obstacles. The obstacles is more on the business side. So whether you are being uh, able to receive uh, the money for the, the electricity that you actually uh, uh, feed into the grid or not. Uh, and so here it's more about the local authorities that uh, should talk to the grid operators and make things happen. Okay. Before okay, or I know, yeah, there's probably some more for, comments. Before we take the next question, Reggie, I think we should uh, start the Mentometer uh, poll. So, uh, is it on screen now, the Mentometer poll? Can we get the question on screen, please? <laughs> I think we can bring it up, it would be... Um, yeah, it would be excellent. So, so you should have a link, I think, appearing in your chat any moment. So that has mm -hmm. just been posted. So you can go to menti.com uh, and enter the code. Um, so I guess while you're you're doing that, I can move on to another Please do. question. Please and do. maybe I can ask this to you, um, Gaia, as you're standing okay. next to me. And it's a it's a bit of a tricky one about nuclear energy. Do we? Is this in this in this graph we have up here? Does it yep. fit into the green column? Is it renewable? Is it green? How do we approach this? Well, it, it is obviously not renewable, but it's definitely carbon uh, beneficial. So it doesn't emit a lot of carbon dioxide. And as a transition period uh, from where we are now, where we are heavily dependent on uh, the use of uh, gas and coal to drive the, uh, the core energy production, it might be sort of a temporary solution that bridges us into a more... Uh, renewable energy future. Okay, and this is still, this is a politically variable um, thing, isn't it, across the EU and more worldwide? You, you have countries where it's completely excluded. I mean, Germany has just decided not to use nuclear energy anymore, whereas you have other countries like France and Finland, for instance, where a nuclear, at least in Finland, they are building new nuclear power stations now. In, in Sweden, they are discussing it. In the UK, they are building new 
uh, nuclear power stations. And also France is discussing what to do when their current uh, nuclear stations are, or power stations are uh, reaching end of life. So, so the big question is that it's, uh, it, it's varied across Europe, how they, they look at it. But if it depends, sort of, it's a risk benefit analysis, right? What is, what is the worst? Is the worst thing that we are pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or is the worst thing that we are for a while generating uh, radioactive waste that okay. needs to be managed? Could I just ask, add a comment on that? Because if we're looking into, uh, well, on the one hand, it's how much electricity we have available and that we need to increase the, the amount. But on the other hand, uh, when it comes to nuclear, it's the cost. I mean, all uh, experience from building a, a nuclear plant, power plant, is extremely costly. And it takes like 10 years to plan it, and it takes 10 years to build it. Yeah. So if we really want to become renewable fast, we should build solar panels and windmills. It's very fast, and it's cheaper, much cheaper than uh, nuclear power. Well, it looks like the audience is agreed with you on this and made the case for <laughs> renewable energy. What do you think? Uh, no, I, I think this is, uh, this is what we can expect. I mean, it's sort of completely unanimous that uh, we should go renewable. And of course, we should go renewable. That is, we all agree that that is the future. Mm -hmm. But the, we have this transition period, which is in many countries. And, and we are talking about, if you talk about Europe, we, we do have in Europe the capital and, and the possibilities to invest in large-scale uh, solar rollouts on private houses. Mm. But in other parts of the world, I mean, look at China, look at India, they might be much more uh, constrained on their uh, possibilities to, to sort of secure uh, the power, electricity power to their populations. Okay, well, so I'll leave you to it, I think. Yes, um, well, we, we discussed this app from, from Oslo. So uh, I understand that we do have a video for uh, showing uh, how the situation is uh, in Oslo. So maybe we should take the video now. Uh, smart charging and if everyone does the same it will uh, exceed the, the power available on the, the grid so in addition to this uh, I go into my green charge app and uh, enter the state of charge at the moment and set desired state of charge when I want to uh, departure I also need to enter the time of departure. Like this. Now uh, the system will uh, calculate uh, my needed power, uh, similar to other cars, and uh, give my car the right amount of power before I departure. And this is the way to to uh, avoid the grid being exceeded. And uh, if I want uh, a priority, I can select that in the app and uh, pay extra and I will get uh, prioritized power. Okay. So, Karen, I guess this was what you talked about when you discussed previously the way to find a good schedule that the user uses this app and then they enter their arrival time and and how much they want to charge and mm -hmm. and that guy he looked quite happy right that guy looked very happy uh, because yeah that's that's another issue regarding this smart control uh, regime in a way that you say might be into the uh, feeling that oh no i don't want others to control my uh, energy use. So uh, what this Green Charge app does 
is that you actually decide uh, when you want to charge your car in a way that uh, you can uh, set up the controller in order for you to increase or maximize the use of solar power to become to charge your car in the most green way uh, or you at, at the same time you could also say no I want to have it at least cost so that will make the optimizer uh, charge your car when the price in the grid is uh, or in the market is at its lowest mostly that's during night uh, and uh, yeah so this this how the scheduler works you as an end user you can uh, influence that and be a part of how to set it up and so also of course the 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 user needs that you enter in your app that's also to ensure that you really get a fully charged car when you need it so it's really important for us uh, that we don't uh, provide a system that is so smart that it doesn't really uh, give you what you want in a way so to um, the end user should feel secure that uh, your needs are met uh, at the same time as uh, you are becoming greener and uh, at lowest cost is there a regret button on this app? So if I change <laughs> my mind and suddenly I want my car uh, yeah. earlier than I originally planned, yeah. is that possible? Or uh, this, will that sort of mess up the system? I mean, uh, that's, the, that's the natural next step, I would say. I mean, uh, here, a Green Charge is a research uh, project and uh, the app uh, has, has been developed from scratch and uh, the next step would be to sort of going in as you have um, entered a charging session as it's called when you you enter your details and you press press charge you have created a session for charging and currently the system uh, is it's difficult to to change the charging session but you can end it and you can provide uh, a new one then yeah i see um, and I, I guess that in that case, the electricity might be taken from the grid and, and feed in the extra energy that you need in order to, to raise the, the red line of your graphs uh, in the situations where you need more energy in a shorter time span. Um, so is sure. the red line in your graphs yeah. represent what you are able to produce from the solar panels? Yeah. Then, then I guess that you can use extra energy from, from the grid in order to increase yeah. that uh, maximum yeah. charging level. I think it's, it's also important to, to say that, uh, it, I mean, the idea of a smart energy neighborhood, it's not that we're like disconnecting from the grid. I mean, it's about to make the integration smoother. Yeah? Mm. It's about to utilize what we have on site in a more optimal way, but still also exchanging with the grid. So it makes, it gives a benefit for both because if you have excess electricity, so you produce more solar power than you can use in your home or to charge your car or to fill up your stationary battery, then you could actually provide it to the grid, which is mm. a benefit for society. So you, prov you make the electricity grid greener. On the other hand, you are also dependent on the grid when the sun is not shining, right? So that means during night or uh, in winter. So then you uh, would like to buy the electricity from the grid. So but, it's, uh, it's a benefit for both. But I guess those, those times of day is when this battery comes into play, right? Hmm. Um, but batteries are costly. So isn't it sort of a waste of resources to install big batteries in every house around mm. the neighborhood? Yeah. I mean, uh, the incentives for... So what you buy the electricity from in the grid is more expensive than what you uh, receive when you feed it into the grid. So I think there is a difference there of uh, maybe four times as high you need to buy it from yeah. the grid. So you have already an incentive to utilize as much electricity on site for yourself. And then, of course, uh, having a stationary battery, you could use more of your locally produced energy yourself. The challenge is, however, that this battery is really costly. Mm. Uh, and the, the studies that I have done with my students uh, 
uh, is that it's it, it's not beneficial to to invest in because it's so costly. But but what if the neighborhood has a battery then? Mm. Is that a possibility to share it with share the cost with all the neighbors? Yeah. So having a shared battery is actually a, a much better solution. The challenge is uh, who is going to own this battery. So, uh, and that's when we come into the uh, regulation, energy regulations. Uh, so the energy regulations say that we need to uh, um, divide or separate between those who are providing the grid services, so the transmission of the electricity, and those who are producing electricity. Uh, and uh, having a battery, you are sort of uh, doing both. So you are, uh, if you're connecting the battery to the neighborhood, it's more like a grid service, right? You, you just mm. you try to keep your capacity at the lowest possible place. But on the other hand, you are selling energy. So this is a real challenge for the regulation, energy regulation authorities in Europe at the moment. And that's why they are now uh, providing or they're testing it in different uh, cases. So you can, uh, the grid companies have been able to invest in batteries and also uh, control them, but it's, it's only in a test stadium. But, but the, the car that you have over on your side, that is also a battery on wheel, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, so can I just use that as a, my battery to avoid investing in, in a stationary battery and, and take energy from the car? Uh, yes. I mean, here again, if we are going to use the car as a stationary battery, it should also be able to draw electricity from the battery, right? So that means what we call vehicle to grid. Uh, however, the technology for vehicle to grid currently is, uh, is yeah, it's on the developing stage and it's not uh, available for everyone at the moment. Uh, so uh, as we saw in going through the, the chart earlier today, it's when it comes to car charging, it's more about making a good plan. So optimal scheduling again of when to charge your car so that you avoid increasing your peaks of demand for your home. So it means that the, um, your house has a sort of uh, a, a consumption profile and it peaks at about five or six when you make your dinner, right? Mm. And that's also when you come home and plug in your car. Yeah. So you would really not want to charge your car at the same time as you're making dinner. So that's why what this optimal charger does. It's that it, it also uh, adapts to the other energy uses within your home mm. so that the grid is not uh, yeah, uh, being uh, having a, a higher, uh, how do you call it, higher demand uh, at that time. So, so what you are saying is that this optimizer and this scheduler is really really crucial for such a neighborhood to to work the way we intend it to work yes that's the core part but yeah. for those to work they need data and then they need data from the little guy that you have behind you on on, yeah. this, <laughs> on there and, and he has an app so yeah. uh, maybe we should return a little bit to this app and, and see how that works yeah um, so do we have we have one of the app developers with us today uh, so if we can get uh, call upon paul Hi, Paul. Can you hear us, Paul? Hello. I can hear you, and now you can maybe hear me as well. Right? We can, we can. So, Paul, right. you, you have been in charge of this app that this lucky guy behind Karen uh, is holding. So, tell us about it. Uh, the app that uh, Seattle uh, um, demonstrated in, uh, in the video previously, it was developed by us, it's called Set Charge. And uh, uh, where we have developed on the solution where we uh, optimize the use of energy and capacity in, in the um, a community building where, where this, uh, this is set up. And where we take into consideration the need of all the different um, EV drivers there, like uh, Shetil said, he put in uh, the amount of energy in the car at the moment uh, when he's planning to leave and if he needs the priority charging or not. And then we plan this 
uh, so that his car is fully charged or charged enough uh, when he plans to leave uh, with the use of uh, uh, energy from the grid uh, and uh, the solar on the on the, uh, on the roof of this, these buildings uh, with different algorithms. So that, that's, and we try to optimize uh, the use of the available energy, basically, and limiting the cost and limiting the need of uh, uh, in investing in uh, ex expensive infrastructure there. But the app is working now, right? Yeah, the app is working, and the app is, uh, uh, is what uh, uh, the app that Ketil was demonstrating that he, he put in there. Uh, at the moment, you have to do that manually to save the state of charge. Uh, the goal is, of course, in the future to have it as much as possible automated, like Karen said. Um, and then we need, need data from the car, which at the moment some car producers are starting to give up, give out, but uh, it's not available on all cars yet. And then in the future, if we also get access to your calendar and uh, your planning tools, uh, then we can plan that automatically. At the moment, we need input from from you as a driver. But but you but, don't uh, energy uh, available energy we get from uh, from the solar panels and from uh, from the use of energy in the building uh, in general. So so that's automatic. That's automatic. Yes. And the question you had before, and what happens if you want to change this, or I want to leave earlier than planned, then we then we replan or reschedule the charging if if you put new information in, into uh, into our app, so that uh, we replan re the use of energy every uh, every 15 minutes, about. Okay, um, but for the future, bright future that you described with. Uh, connecting my calendar to my car to my my charging point to to your app uh, does that create a privacy legal issue with my personal data because the car will know when i'm away and, and you will know it as well so if you want to break into my house when i'm away then you're free to do so uh, of course that's uh, the all uh, has all to be taken into consideration we work with uh, all according to gdpr rules the european gdpr rules and uh, so that shouldn't be a problem but of course it, it is a safety issue so you have to be sure and get trust in the in the systems um, that, that you connect to uh, but we believe that in uh, in the not too distant future we will have this automated uh, and, and if if you're not willing to share this data, then you won't will have to pay extra, or it will be more difficult for you as well. So, um, um, so you are sharing a lot of data already. So there will be incentives that stimulates me to to actually participate in this. Uh, yes. yes, and uh, uh, like I said, data from the car is uh, in in a couple of years, or all new cars on the market today, they automatically can share the data so we know what uh, state of charge the car has and communicates it so when you connect to charging station you could um, uh, we could aut automatically know that uh, you drive an Audi e-tron and you have an agreement with this and this power uh, supplier so that the bill goes to there uh, so on. that's the it's not available at the moment but that's part of the future and uh, it has to be developed. A lot of things will happen in the next three years. But while talking about this, I mean, if I take my car and want to go someplace else, um, yeah. some faraway place, um, are there solutions for that as well? Yes, uh, there are there's several solutions. And at, at the moment, this market is a little bit chaotic with the apps, uh, a lot of apps there. Exactly. I yeah. do there. And, uh, roaming is starting to come but uh, we believe that in the, in a couple of years this will be regulated in the same way that the, the mobile industry was a few years back so that mm -hmm. you can use your mobile in any european country now or any country worldwide which wasn't possible not too long ago and the prices will be uh, fair as well in, in a way, you can say that uh, Tesla has done it, that uh, it, it's a closed system, but all Tesla drivers can 
just connected Tesla to any Tesla charger and uh, and it automatically automatically charges and they know Tesla knows that it's it's your car and it's charged your credit card etc and in the future there will be open standards connecting all different cars and drivers and charge uh, charge point operators to each other so it will be fully integrated system sometime Karin? I could just uh, add uh, that uh, yeah, in, in Green Charge, uh, we have had a uh, Hubject on board in the project that has investigated the, the uh, or procured or uh, how do you call it, solved some part of these issues. So they have uh, um, developed a roaming uh, service so that you can use the charging points of other providers uh, with uh, only one app. Yeah, uh, so Hubject is definitely part of the solution here, and uh, mm -hmm. there's other uh, similar solutions as well, and uh, they, we just need to share all the data to make it possible, and mm -hmm. so far it's been a, a challenge with the traditional car producers haven't been willing to share the information for, from their cars, so, mm -hmm. and that's that's coming now, and then the diff of course the different charge point operators hasn't been willing to sh share the information on the on their customers as well so it's been uh, it's, it's been a closed uh, closed market which is um, uh, getting better mm. Mm. Yeah, and i could also add a little bit more about that because uh, this data issue has really been a challenge also uh, in in the oslo pilot so it's not only about uh, making it technically feasible to uh, uh, transfer data in real time because we as you said we make an optimal schedule every 15 minutes which means that we need to transfer a lot of data uh, many times or uh, often uh, and then we need to have the legal part as well so uh, having the <laughs> yeah all the uh, contracts between the different uh, providers has been very challenging and time consuming, not least. Mm. But, but the experiments from, from Oslo, what does they tell us about uh, the user's sort of willingness to continue to use this kind of input, manual input over time? I yeah. would think that people are very enthusiastic in the beginning and then <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Yeah, uh, and then we're into this, okay, should it be uh, some sort of benefit or should it be uh, some uh, punishment if you don't? Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, the, what is left to investigate now in Green Charge. We will have a, a questionnaire where we ask the users how they feel about entering all this uh, data uh, before starting their charging. So I, I think that will be one of the interesting uh, parts left in the in the project that's good to hear that it's being investigated <laughs> because i'm always afraid that if you have an app where you regularly need to put in too much information then you will sort of stop using it actively over time so yeah, one so one solution could be that okay if you don't enter it you won't be able to start your charging right mm -hmm. so yeah yep Paul. Yeah, uh, uh, at the moment you have to share this, and I think most people have been enthusiastic uh, as part of this development. And uh, uh, also, the EV drivers in most countries today are uh, trendsetters or early movers, and uh, tend to then want to help and want to be part of this this movement in a way. And uh, uh, but for the like in Norway, where we see. EVs as a mass market product now, you don't see the enthusiasts uh, at the same level anymore. So it has to be automatic. Um, mm -hmm. And then the sharing of the data, and you asked before what about your data. And the, in our belief, your data belongs to you. We just use it to optimize solutions for you. And if you uh, leave this premise where we control it, you get the data. We can delete your data. So that you're out of our system. Okay, so, so thank you, Paul. Before moving on to the next session, uh, or before moving on, uh, I think we should check with Reggie. Uh, are there more questions from the audience? No more questions at, at this time. So, so that leaves us on to sort of 
closing this session. And I would like to sort of have a final statement from uh, the participants. And Paul disappeared. It was a little sad that you disappeared, Paul. I hope that we can get you back. There you are. Thank you. <laughs> because you also have your say in this. Uh, so maybe we should start with ladies first. Karen, what do you think are the sort of um, main things that we need to look at in the near future? So I will start with the simplest first. Uh, use electric vehicles. Uh, it's possible and it's green. Yeah, that was simple. Yeah, simple. Simple as that. <laughs> Paul? Uh, sharing of data and automation. Uh, uh, the traditional car producers, energy producers and so on are uh, conservative companies and they have to start uh, sharing the data and uh, open the protocols to to enable automation of everything. And all these smart solutions and in the future, uh, artificial intelligence needs the data to work properly. And we can solve the challenges. Hmm. I also think we have an issue on the regulatory side, both with respect to establishing this kind of neighborhoods where energy can flow sort of freely among neighbors, but also in order to to plan and, and create the right incentives for people to install solar panels on in a large scale, because it is a private investment which is required among many different households, I think. So. I agree. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm going more into the details. My, my second uh, tip is, is that uh, we, we need to or to, to be able to enable our smart uh, neighborhood and smart uh, and green society we need to have more uh, predictive controls so optimizers that can provide this schedule and planning of when to use what because uh, uh, in up to now, the electricity system and the power system has been developed such that that uh, the production follows the demand, right? But now we need to change demand so that it follows when the production is available. So when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing, and that is what uh, the smart controls and and uh, the energy smart system uh, provides. Mm. Um, who do you think should be in charge of this? Um, if you look at the household, it's obviously me, but if you look at the neighborhood, mm -hmm. who should be in charge of this optimization and, and these decisions made in a neighborhood? Should, should I be on a constant fight with my neighbor stealing my electricity at uh, odd times, right? Yeah, and that's where we have the uh, communities, energy communities, uh, as uh, we're talking about. Then you have to uh, make a, uh, an agreement with your neighbor in order to create such a, uh, an energy community, in a way. Mm. But it's, uh, yeah, there is a, a few steps towards uh, going. But I guess, I mean, if all my neighbors are using Paul's app, yeah. then, then Paul, you can help me with organizing my neighbors as well, right? Yeah, yeah then we can help organize the neighbors. And if, uh, then it should be, equally shared in a way and if, 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 as fair as possible and if you need prior uh, to be prioritized then then you're also willing to pay for that and you sh you should pay for that for instance in the community building if you're a taxi driver you need more ch uh, more charging than uh, somebody who's just driving to the uh, to the grocery store once a week so uh, but then you're also willing to to pay for this and uh, it comes then becomes a good for all of them. So, uh, but there are definitely a, a lot of obstacles to be uh, uh, taken care of here. And there has to be trust in the systems and, mm. uh, and trust in your neighbors. <laughs> not in, not in. And that's maybe the hardest part, right? <laughs> Could be, yeah. yeah. Definitely. And, and related to that in the energy regulation, it also says that you, sh as an uh, end user, you should freely choose or your ener electricity provider. 
right? That's in a free market. So creating these energy communities, that is a kind of a challenge as well, because uh, if you're in this community, you can only choose the energy community uh, provider, mm. right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, the yeah, legislation would, and, would, uh, yeah. Would be a democratic uh, solution in a way then, that the, the community decides which energy provider we choose for yeah. our yeah. group. And that's um, where the regulations needs to follow. It has to adapt to these, uh, these new sort of things, but it, which is currently is not in place. Mm. Do, do, you, do any of you know if there is initiatives on changing the regulation in this area? I know from Norway, at least, we have uh, the, the uh, regulator, like a regulator authority has uh, provided that they, they could investigate sandboxes, as they call it. Okay. So they, you can apply for uh, being exempted from the energy regulation in order to investigate this. But uh, so far, I'm not sure if any of the applications have gone through, but uh, they're on the investigation stadium, at least. Okay, so the neighborhood is going back to the sandbox. <laughs> or starting there. At least. <laughs> starting there, yeah. But it's like I said before, it's a new market and it's challenging to move these large corporates that have uh, had monopolies in a way. But uh, the regulators are working on it and it has you, you see some changes just in the last couple of years now you're if you have a charge point you can sell the energy from that without having uh, being regulated or having a um, concession which is called in norway so licensing yeah licensing yeah it's mm -hmm. exactly and uh, uh, so there it's moving slowly but uh, things are happening uh, luckily mm. Mm. i'm happy to hear that um, we have talked about uh, neighborhoods and in our graphical illustration here as well, it seems to be like a neighborhood of separate housing. Uh, what about uh, community housing or uh, housing cooperatives mm. where many flats are in the same building? I mean, mo most of us are living in cities where we are living in this kind of uh, housing communities or buildings, apartment blocks. How, what, what, what are the possibilities of installing solar panels in, in that kind of environment? Yeah, I can only answer for Norwegian conditions. Uh, so, uh, as I just told about uh, that uh, the energy regulations, they say that uh, you should freely choose your electricity provider. Then, uh, uh, when you're in a flat, uh, then it means that you, in any, every flat, uh, every single flat could have a, a different electricity provider. But if you have solar panels on your rooftop, to which electricity provider should this uh, production uh, yeah, being uh, responded to, in a way? So that's uh, what the authorities in Norway have said, okay, the solar panels should only go to the common uh, consumption which means lighting in the hallway or in the staircase or uh, uh, elevators or yeah, and, or charging of electric uh, cars in the in a common garage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you actually, you cannot use it in your household yet. There are also some changes now, uh, very new changes. So um, where you can actually be, uh, how do you call it, remunerated. Uh, each of the so then you kind of share the remuneration of the electricity that you uh, feed into the grid uh, equally on all the uh, apartments. Mm. Uh, but again, it's just an economic uh, way of uh, of calculating this because, as we know from before, the electrons they flow where they want, and that's in the direction where you need electricity. Yeah. yeah. So if I have a rooftop solar panel and I switch on my washing machine. I can still use it even though I'm not. You will. I will use it. <laughs> so I think that is uh, what I needed to hear. Yeah. Uh, thank you for participating, both of you. Thank you to the audience for listening in. And thank you for the organizers for, for this session. So uh, I think we will close here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.